Hello and welcome. I'm Anna Danziger Halperin, Associate Director for the Center for Women's History here at the New York Historical Society. Before we begin tonight's program, I would like to thank Louise Muir, our President and CEO, Agnes Xu Tang, Chair of the Board of Trustees, and Pam Schaffler, our Chair Emerita, as well as all of our trustees, Joyce B. Cowan, Diane Max and the late Adam Max, Jean Margot Reed, and the Mellon Foundation, along with our Chairman's Council, our members, and our many other generous donors. None of the work of New York Historical would be possible without your continued and committed support. As the Associate Director of our Center for Women's History, I'm proud of the growth we've achieved here at the Center. Our scholarship, education, programs, collecting, and not least of all exhibitions, all foreground women's critical role in American history. Tonight's program is titled Newport, Gilded Age Fashion Capital. All of us at the center have been so excited to follow HBO's show Gilded Age as it explores many of the same questions that we do in our own work about gender, race, and power in New York at the turn of the century. Our blog, Women at the Center, has been diving into the history behind the show, and we're thrilled to continue that conversation tonight um, around Newport fashion. A few logistics, the program will run for approximately 45 minutes, followed by a Q&A. At any time during our program tonight, please submit your questions through the Q&A feature located on your screen, and we'll answer as many questions as we can. And now I'm delighted to introduce our panel for the evening. Rebecca J. Kelly is a te textile and dress historian studying America's Gilded Age. She's particularly interested in considering what is American style and revealing the work of under-recognized women fashion and textile designers. Her current research explores the economies of New England resort cities and establishes legacies for women who made and retailed sportswear. Rebecca is the deputy director and curator of the South County Museum in Narragansett, Rhode Island. She's also an assistant teaching professor at the University of Rhode Island in the Department of Textiles, Fashion, Merchandising, and Design. She holds a BA in art history and an MS in textile conservation from the University of Rhode Island as well. Rebecca guest curated the summer 2021 exhibitions, The World in Motion, Fashion and Modernity, 1885 to 1945 at the Newport Historical Society and Women Take the Wheel, Fashion, Modernity and the Automobile, 1905 to 1945 at the Audrain Automobile Museum. Our moderator this evening is my colleague, Karen Ben Horan. She's a fashion historian and curatorial scholar at the Center for Women's History at the New York Historical Society and a PhD candidate in history at New York University. She's the co-curator of the documentary film, Mrs. G, which won first prize at the Phoenix Art Museum Fashion Film Festival, and has curated several fashion exhibitions in New York and Israel. Karen co-authored the fashion history survey, She's Got Legs, A History of Hemlines and Fashion, and the book, edited the book, The Sweater, A History, both from Schiffler Press. We're thrilled to have Rebecca and Karen with us tonight. I'll now turn the conversation over to Karen to get things started. Thank you, Anna. Welcome, Rebecca. Um, I'm very excited to have you here. And I think before we start, I think full disclosure uh, is required because you were my professor at grad school. Um, so almost everything I know about this time period really comes from what you taught me, <laughs> uh, which is even more exciting uh, to have you here. And so we are kind of using HBO's Gilded Age as a, a sort of a springboard, right, to talk more broadly about why and how Newport um Newport's unique way of life really shapes American fashion um, in a special way. And, and Newport is not only really kind of central to central location in the show, but it's also depicted as kind of this like important site for um, wealthy women like Bertha Russell to kind of really wield their social power. So I thought maybe we'll just kind of go back to the beginning and and to ask like why why Newport like how does Newport become um, attractive for kind of New York um, one you know New York's one percent? 
Sure. Um, yeah. And thanks so much for having me, Karen. I do remember well our trip many years ago when I was right. teaching at the Fashion Institute of Technology. I think we barreled up on a bus from New York yeah. uh, to Newport. Um, so let me uh, see if I can share my screen here and pull up um, some images. Uh, let's see. Uh -huh. All right. Does that look okay? Looks great. Okay, here we go. So um, we barreled up here on a bus, but you couldn't do that. <laughs> um, <back laughs> in um, and I thought we'd take a bird's eye view and just look at a couple of maps here just mm -hmm. to get everyone a, a real sense of things. And I'll just put a little blue circle around here. You know, there's um, Long Island down here, the mm -hmm. Connecticut coast, tiny little Rhode Island tucked in here um, between Massachusetts and Connecticut. And I think that's one of the magical things for it as a developing resort in the Gilded Age. It was situated between the metropolis of New York and Boston, just right here um, in the middle. So that was a very advantageous uh, spot for this little city by mm -hmm. the sea. Uh, and here we sort of have another map. We can sort of zoom in. Here's the state of Rhode Island. Um, and I'll put a circle around Aquidneck Island here because Newport is on an island um, that is separate from mainland Rhode Island, Aquidneck Island. And it's really the totality of the island, Newport at the southern tip and Middletown and Portsmouth, two other towns on the island that created this beautiful microcosm for people. You had the bustling town of Newport and then these more bucolic outlying areas in Portsmouth and Middletown that just have these like beautiful uh, scenic landscape, you know, in Newport situated in here in, in Narragansett Bay, um, you know, and it's just surrounded by water on all sides and just incredibly um, beautiful. Uh, and again, just a few more things. Newport has this lovely deep harbor um, that's very vital to its sailing and yachting community. Um, the grand houses that we see in the Gilded Age series are along the cliffs here, um, which I just highlighted mm -hmm. in blue. So that's this beautiful cliff walk. And then the northern tip of the island here, um, whoops. Uh, that I've circled here. This is where a railway line did come onto the island uh, in the 19th century. Um, so interesting to think about how people got here, right? I wanted to ask you, like, what was the trip like from New York to Newport at this time? Yeah, I think it was part of the adventure, uh, you know, and I think <laughs> another reason why people liked it, it seemed just far enough away and it was a little bit tricky to get uh, to this island and certainly the most luxurious way to come would have been by private yacht and end up in the harbor. And this is a wonderful photograph um, from the Library of Congress collection showing John Jacob Astor's guests arriving at a little landing outpost that, you know, the New York Yacht Club had. Um, so that was one way. Uh, let's see, you know, you could also, of course, people were coming to Newport from much farther afield than just Boston and New York. Mm -hmm. So lots of people were making these multi-day journeys and maybe ending up in New York City, staying at one of these grand hotels. And then they would hop a train that would start taking them to Rhode Island, but not directly to Newport. Uh, this is the train station in West Kingston, Rhode Island. There was another train station in Wickford, Rhode Island at the Wickford Junction. And you'd have to go by stagecoach then and then on a steam trip, so steamship for the final leg of the journey. So it was essentially the 19th century version of planes, trains, and automobiles. Wow, yes. <laughs> so um, the show... You know, we it is, like I said, a very central location. In, we see it a little bit in the first season and second season. It's like full on Newport. Um, but my sense was that the way Newport is depicted is very, I want to say, isolated. It's like an isolated vision of Newport. We see interiors, we see facades, we know that some of them are CGI, and you know, the Elms is not really on the ocean. But I wanted to ask you, you know, you mentioned Newport as like this bustling city. What was Newport beyond these mentions? What was Newport a place like? Yeah, I think, you know, that's always such a great question. And I wish I had the time machine. So, um, you know, but there's lots of great local. That's where we're all historians, right? <laughs> Instead of the time machine. <laughs> 
Exactly. You know, we spend tireless hours like trying to interpret old photographs. We're so lucky with the diverse archives here in the city. But, um, you know, I'd mentioned that train that came down um, from the northern tip of the island and it would have come in here uh, to Long Wharf, you know, which is definitely uh, not looking as glamorous as the types of things, as you mentioned, that we see. Yeah. Uh, on the series, I mean, Bob Shaw and his team of set designers just do like the most magical job. Everything seems like an extra vivid uh, living color. Um, so again, you know, we're only sort of seeing, I think, one dimension and just sort of mentioning these other aspects of the island that, you know, just enamor me, you know, is the geographic beauty of the place. And, you know, I think to do that, you know, there are some um, location shoots, obviously, they really are on the cliffs here uh, in Newport with the television still that we see on the screen. And Newport's Cliff Walk is just one of the most magnificent walks in the world. I might be a little bit biased, yeah. but it's a three and a half mile journey and you're right along the edge of um, the ocean. And here's a great picture postcard depicting people enjoying it during the Gilded Age. The 40 steps here is just a scenic outlook along the cliffs. Um, and there's a lot of interesting um, chat that it was a place where actually the staff from the mansions used to gather at the end of the day. So we see uh, that depicted a lot in the series that the Van Ryan and the Russell's um, staff, you know, talk to each other out in the street and, you know, 40 steps is a place that they might have met. And I love seeing the women here in their white dresses with these black, you know, jackets over them, you know, some of these um, ideas about what you wore on summer vacation is very much depicted here. A wonderful day at Bathers Beach, Easton's Beach in Newport. Um, some rough surf this day, which was, you know, if you're adventurous, this was a great day <laughs> uh, to be in the ocean. Um, but, you know, these women's bathing costumes, you know, as fashion historians, we think about this often, Karen, of <laughs> how did yeah. they do <laughs> A lot of clothing to be in the waves. Mm -hmm. Heavy. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So the other great thing about Newport were you had all these short scenic drives. And that was something that people really liked to do with their leisure time um, during the Gilded Age was to go out for a carriage ride. And you could take these drives. This is Hanging Rock. It's technically in Middletown, Rhode Island, um, the adjacent town in the Paradise Valley, as it's called, which is just, again, such a truly beautiful spot for enjoying landscape. People might have taken a ride out to Lawton Falls, even further afield, which is in Portsmouth. And, you know, these would have been, you know, a good occupied um, portion of your day. You know, you'd leave Bellevue Avenue in your carriage. It was an hour or so to get out there. You'd have your picnic. You'd come back. So it was a great, uh, fun day's mm -hmm. journey. Wow, you've really taken us in the time machine. <laughs> so, so, you know, and, you know, this is depicted in Edith Wharton's novel, The Age of mm -hmm. Innocence, and sort of going out to these more bucolic parts of the island. You know, the Vanderbilt family had their mansions in Newport, but they had these farms out in Portsmouth where they kept horses, and it was this sort of even more relaxed um, environment than um, uh, the houses along the cliffs. Well, you do need to entertain yourself if you're there all summer long. Exactly. <laughs> so um, another kind of favorite scene of mine uh, in this season is, of course, a tennis match at the casino. Mm -hmm. So I was actually quite confused. Is it is it really an actual casino the way we think about casinos today? Or, you know, what was it exactly? Uh, yeah, so no, in the 19th century, the word casino um, was really used more inclusively. It was essentially a social club where people got together to do all sorts of things. And gaming and playing cards um, was certainly um, done at the casino, but it was really a recreation center, basically, uh, for sporting events. Um, you know, today it is the International Tennis Hall of Fame. Um, and I think I have some slides of the casino coming up here. We can jump back to those. 
Um, but yeah, this is Bellevue Avenue where the casino is located. And, you know, I love this photograph. You know, I think it again is showing that real bustling mm -hmm. cityscape. Here's another view of Bellevue Avenue and the entrance to the casino is right here. So you go through this kind of magical gate and you're actually in this beautiful open area for playing tennis that's completely surrounded um, with places for people to sit and have tea and have lunch um, and spend time. But the casino is also built with six storefronts as part of its business plan. Uh, and these were meant to be shops um, that people could come and pick pick up fashionable things for home and for yourself. Um, so that was a really big part of the business plan at the casino. Uh, let's so, um, you know, when we we have these scenes in the show, um, they're so visually beautiful. And one of the things, you know, we, we have these like, you know, landscapes opening up and all of this like beautiful depiction of Newport. But for me, the one thing that really jumped at me was the difference in what people are wearing from city to Newport. Um, so, you know, we know, of course, that in the summer, wealthy Gilded Age women would change their wardrobe to lighter colors and lighter fabrics. Uh, but still, there's it still seems to be sharply different than what they're wearing in the city. We hardly see any color, maybe some stripes, even the men change into white or tan suits. So um, can you describe to us like what was the fashion landscape in Newport at this time? Did people bring clothes from home? Did they purchase them in Newport? Um, were there any kind of Newport renowned um, designers that they went to? What was it like? Yeah, that's a great question and um, something I've just been um, spending so much time for many, many years reading magazines, women's magazines, you know, everything from the most popular ones that we still know today, such as Vogue and Harper's Bazaar, to The Delineator and some of these magazines that, um, you know, are not still in publication, but were really everybody's handbook for <laughs> um, information about dress. Um, and when you're looking at these magazines, usually around April, like the spring issues start giving a lot of advice on how to prepare to go on a uh, summer vacation. And they recommend for women everything that you might need to bring. Um, and, you know, there's some really pithy, fun quotes, some great, you know, hilarious writers um, from the 19th century, you know, talk about um, the newfangled sports of resorts, you know, and they said, you know, young ladies used to go on vacation and you maybe just need a book or a watercolor set. But by the 1870s and 1880s, they're saying, oh no, now you need specialized clothing for bathing, for croquet, to play tennis, um, to do archery, you know, all of these uh, incredible things. And one of the biggest purveyors for this type of clothing um, in the UK was a gentleman named John Redfern, who founded his clothing company um, on the Isle of Wight in the city of Cowes, the great resort um, in England. Um, and he branch expanded his business pretty pervasively throughout the 19th century. You know, he had a branch in London and Edinburgh and Paris, and then he comes across the Atlantic and ends up establishing branches in New York and then Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, so that's pretty exciting for us here in Newport. And I've been following the Redfern Company's history from how they sort of bounced around Newport. And the interesting thing was a lot of these big companies, whether they were international branch expansions or branch expanding expansions from New York to Newport, they only came for the summer. So they really operated as pop-up shops, and I find them in different locations throughout the city um, from year to year. And it seems like it was a bit of a competition uh, for getting your deposit into a lease and, you know, making sure that you had sort of prime real estate uh, for the summer. This is a really lovely um, coat in the University of Rhode Island's collection from about 1895, we know, with these great leg of mutton sleeves. Um, and those of us who get to spend time with material culture often get to see the specialness of the interior um, and the label here. So I love this red fern label, Ladies Tailor, with all these incredible 
Royal Warrants and then Little Newport mm -hmm. Rhode Island down there at the bottom. It's amazing because you think about branches and pop-up stores or something very contemporary, but you can see that it has a, a really extensive history. Yeah, I was so surprised to find that, you know, I it just wasn't something that I had really thought about. Um, and it's just it's fascinating. I also wonder a lot about this coat. I was initially interpreting it like, oh, maybe it had a skirt that, you know, is no longer with it. Um, but then also through my research, I've been finding that Redfern really started to promote this idea of the separate, the blazer. Oh, wow. um, so I'm so curious, you know, again, uh, really wondering uh, a lot about this piece and then seeing those women with, um, you know, the blazers over their lightweight summer dresses when they were down on 40 steps, you know, Newport is so breezy <laughs> and cool in the summer. Um, I think people thought a lot about the climate and blazers just became, I think, a central component of sportswear. I have a, a random question about the label, actually. I see that it says uh, ladies tailor. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if it's because Redfern is a man, like would a woman be a dressmaker or there's no distinction between those two things? Yeah, it's so interesting. And like the Redfern, like so many of these companies that branch expand, it was usually like it was I think initially Redfern's son, Ernest, who came to the United States and set up the tailoring firm uh, here. Um, but from my understanding, you know, the term tailoring really comes from the stuffs of what you're working with. So when you're working with wool and cutting tailored coats, um, you're sort of a tailor. And when you're working with silks and organza and embroidery and beadwork, um, you're a dressmaker. Mm. Um, and Redfern, like so many of makers of clothing in the UK, um, tailoring and the wool was the stuff that they were really, really uh, good at. So um, interesting. Tell us more about New, uh, Newport's kind of retail because it's it's quite fascinating because it is like going back to this idea of Newport as a place. It really gives you a sense of the place that they were storefronts, that they were pop up, that they were kind of public spaces, not just going into a dressmaker going into a wealthy person's house, but also something more akin to the shopping that we know to today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, another person whose career I've been really interested in is um, Catherine Donovan. She was an Irish American dressmaker um, who immigrated to the United States um, in the early part um, of the 19th century. She had a long and pervasive career. And she really, when you look at her, she pops up all the time in Vogue magazine. And her, um, you know, she has this really newsy obituary when she passes away in 1906. So we learn so much about her and her shop in New York. And it was only recently going through the Newport Daily News that I figured out that she did have a shop here in Newport as early as 1885. Um, so I was really like thrilled to find this out. Um, you know, she was the known dressmaker to the Vanderbilts, the Astors, the Goulets. And, you know, she had a business model, which was pretty pervasive in New York in the 19th century, is that she was copying French fashion. She was mm -hmm. finding out what was going on in the Grand Couture houses in Paris, but not everybody could get to Paris every year. So she was making copies of these dresses in New York uh, for her clients and then kind of coming up to Newport. And, you know, the Gilded Age is a really transitional time for fashion history, as we know. You're sort of sandwiched between the importance still of the custom dressmaking trade, but ready to wear clothing is increasing in popularity and demand. So I think a lot of these dressmakers were selling ready to wear goods, too, like mantles, cloaks fans, hats. So I think they definitely had all of these things in their shops too. And shopping was really starting to become a pastime in Newport, you know, going up and down Bellevue Avenue and going in and out of these shops um, was a leisure pursuit in and of itself. So what could a woman during this time period expect to find in a store like that? Yeah, um, let's see, maybe I can skip ahead a few slides here. Here's some great examples of Catherine Donovan's work, these, you know, great frothy dressmaking. Mm -hmm. So this is like the dressmaking versus the tailoring. And you know, you'd need both of these things when you came to Newport, these types of dresses for dinners and dances and those tailored clothings, uh, clothing for walking about. And again, I love to share with everyone what um, those of us who work with objects often get to see are these beautiful labels. So that's how we know 
um, who these dressmakers are. They leave a little bit of their legacy in their gowns. And again, another glimpse of um, the shops along Bellevue Avenue, a beautiful building built in the early 20th century with these grand windows now for visual merchandising, mm -hmm. just like you're saying, Karen, all of these modern concepts are coming to fashion here uh, in little old Newport, Rhode Island. <laughs> um, yeah, so here's another um, dressmaker who I just wanted to highlight, Molly O'Hara. Um, you know, I have found out so much about her career, and she had a shop in that beautiful Odrain building that I just showed you um, from 1906 to 1930. She came up every wow. summer. Um, and I know that Molly, like Catherine, she kind of, I think, I don't know that they knew each other, but I suspect that they must have, um, and that Molly really admired her. She was like that generation younger, and I think really took her place in the New York fashion landscape um, after uh, Catherine Donovan um, closed her business. So these designers would be known in New York, and then their customers would be expecting them to also be in Newport in the summer, essentially. Yeah, absolutely. I found evidence that people ordered dresses in New York in, you know, in May, June, and then we're like, I'll pick it up um, at the Bellevue Avenue store when I get there. Um, so that was super convenient thing for their clients and lots of dressmakers, I think, um, you know, started doing that. And this is um, that lovely label I just showed you in this extraordinary suit from wow. 1913 that's still privately held by the Vanderbilt family. They steward Alice Vanderbilt's uh, clothing collection and were generous enough to share some of these garments with the Newport audience. And I curated those exhibitions a few summers ago and this lovely suit was one of the ones included. And Molly O'Hara had a streak of good luck in her career. Um, she was recognized really early on in 1897. She won a model doll competition where designers were working in this tiny scale um, to show off their creations. And that really kickstarted uh, her career, which I think is most important because then she was featured uh, in the magazine. So we have this glimpse of what she looked like in 1897. Um, and here she is a little bit later in her career. So again, Molly O'Hara and Catherine Donovan's names are sort of lost to history. But when I go back to the documentary sources, oh, they must have just been so well known. That's They're what, you know, that's what strikes me as you were speaking that, you know, we have these women, we know very little about them, but obviously they were very well known and very successful uh, entrepreneurs. Exactly. And, you know, Molly O'Hara designed for theater and Broadway. She was designing for, you know, the social elite. She was designing for first ladies. So she was having, you know, this career just like, you know, really contemporary designers that we know today, you know. Um, so the model of American fashion, if you think about someone like Oscar de la Renta, was like set by this previous generation of women designers who I think are sometimes very much under-recognized. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You mentioned before, kind of in passing, this idea of um, resort fashion that we see during that time period, maybe a little bit before the 80s, but kind of like in the 70s, late 60s, early 70s, this new idea of resort fashion, um, this, this idea that there is a specific way of dressing that's tied to a location that's tied to going away so what are some of uh, kind of like the hallmarks of resort fashion yeah yeah let's take a look at a few more of these images and this is an ad from one of molly's competitors who had a shop in the um uh, uh, casino building and again you can see here that you know she mm -hmm. is bringing with her a lot of um, these accessories, you know, the, the gloves, the parasols, everything that you would need. Um, so this was a, a great find. And then also, again, she's trying to balance that. She's like, I got all this ready-made stuff, but you can also get something fitted here <laughs> if you need to. So this is the LP Hollander and Company. Uh, and let's just kind of click ahead here. These are some- So, so actually, before you answer my, um, my resource yeah. <laughs> question, Essentially, what you're saying, showing us this ad, is that you would go into a store, you can buy all of these accessories, all of those little things ready-made, but you can also order 
kind of couture or custom made garments because at this time we still don't have ready full ready made clothes. Yeah, and I think that that was a tough thing for designers of Molly's generation. They had to try to figure out how to surf that line. And, you know, Molly's career is quite interesting to me as we move into the 1930s. She further branch expanded to Palm Beach, Florida, and the very final advertisements of hers that I see um, in the early 30s, she's getting very, very much into like sportswear and and more ready-made things so that's really interesting to think about like in comparison to these um late 19th century early 20th century dresses of alice vanderbilt you know these are the evening gowns um and then this is what we did as part of the exhibition like trying to give this sense of what molly's shop might have looked like so you know we did have that acknowledgement that you know a lot of the advertisements say they were still able to custom fit things for you but that you could go in and buy some accessories. You know, you're coming in to pick your dress up. It's ready, but do you need gloves? Do you need a hat? Do you need anything yes. else? <laughs> you, know? <laughs> <My family. laughs> you know, and then uh, some of these great dresses by Molly, these are, you know, into the 1920s and starting to be in the 30s here. And you can see the simplicity um, of the of the silhouettes kind of coming into mm -hmm. being sure. So let's see. Yeah, here's, you know, again, some peaks inside the casino now to maybe answer your question a little bit better about the sportswear. Karen, you know, here's a great, again, still from the from the series yeah. um, on site in New York. And here we can see this idea of like navy and white as a resort fashion, kind of distinctive resort fashion um, element. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I just, that white summer dress over and over and over again, that's what you needed to get uh, if you were going up to Newport. You know, again, just showing you kind of the gorgeousness of this building. You can see how you had all these little areas where people could spend time together. Um, here people are just, you know, enjoying cocktails um, on the porches. And we're so lucky that this building was preserved here in Newport. Um, you know, amazing. Those of us who live here love it when we get invited to something there at the summer. <laughs> uh, you know, there's still these wonderful parties. Um, you know, this was a great scene where the casino was used at, in the evening um, for um, a ball. There were definitely parties and dances um, held at this social club. And then people would come there in the day to watch tennis and everybody got the memo <laughs> about the white yes. dress. <laughs> So fantastic, right? And the gentlemen there probably in their navy blazers. Mm -hmm. And you know, here are the folks playing tennis, which is also amazing. I love seeing women playing tennis in bustle dresses. I wonder how it was possible because in the 1870s and 80s, there was very little modification to that fashionable silhouette. Maybe the skirt was a little bit shorter. And it's not until we get into the 1890s or the turn of the century that you start to see you know, much more practical. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's quite amazing. And actually, I think like, you know, we should say that tennis is one of the first sports activities where we have gender mixing and women really are um, playing tennis professionally from the beginning. Yeah, exactly. You know, tennis, I think, was so important when we think about the um, modification of women's dress, um, you know, finally, the loosening of the corset and the going away of all of these contraptions that kind of really constrained 19th century women. Um, you know, just to, again here, this is an advertisement from the Jordan Marsh Company, which was more of a middle market department store, mm -hmm. um, because I do like to think about these multi levels and, you know, very wealthy women were shopping at couture houses, but there's so much evidence too that they were, you know, absolutely going into these new department stores as well. The Jordan Marsh Company was a New England based uh, department store. A summer dress like this was advertised for $25, which would have been about $125 of um, today's money. So um, still a really expensive garment. And then we see Bertha here and wearing almost an exact, uh, you know, version of this white summer dress in Newport. Absolutely, with all the ruffles and she looks like a cake. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, it occurred to me watching the show, first to your point about the department stores, because I do, like, they don't really show them going to department stores. And I think even the wealthy would go at least to have lunch and socialize. And you have these rooms where you could 
socialize in the department store. And another thing that I was thinking, and maybe you can help a little bit with that. I think during this time period, women change clothes several times a day, right? And we don't really see that in the show. I mean, they do change their clothes quite a bit, but we're not, we don't see them sort of like talking about changing or needing to change from morning to afternoon to evening. Um, so I don't know, like, do you have anything to say about that? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And I just sort of popped ahead to this slide. This is a shop in Newport. And, um, you know, I just wish there were more photographs of interiors of stores. And I was mm -hmm, so thrilled mm -hmm. to find this one of the Bonton Millinery Shop on Thames <laughs> Street, um, which is, you know, sort of down the hill and much closer to the harbor than um, Bellevue Avenue, more of a local shopping district. But I know that the women of the summer colony definitely went to these stores on Thames Street. Um as well so yeah so so interesting to to think about yeah how much stuff you needed um and people think yeah you know that women might have changed in the morning you had a an outfit for going out in the morning and then the afternoon you were definitely going to participate maybe in some kind of sporting event go bathing so you would change again then you needed to change for dinner so I think it was a minimum of three changes and then people can speculate that it might have been as many as five you know depending on how um, busy you were <laughs> exactly what you'd gotten invited to mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that day um just sort of popping you outside of that Bonton millinery shop and seeing what Thames Street uh would look like and yeah again you know they show Bloomingdale's a few times in the series um you know which I think is um fascinating you know, and these are all the little accoutrements that you would need, you know, hats and pocketbooks and parasols and an advertisement from that same Jordan Marsh catalog, which, you know, shows these cloaks and mantles that didn't need that exact fit. So that's, mm -hmm. stuff that, you know, people are starting to be able to buy those things off the peg and fashion retailers and dressmakers are realizing that's like big business. Um so interesting to think about. And really what's enabling all of this is like this boom in production, this ability to produce in big numbers and cheaper and um, something that we, we didn't have before. And all of a sudden you have to, you know, you're making all of that stuff and you need to say to people, you need that stuff. You need to change. You need a bag that matches this and a parasol that matches that. And, you know, all of those little things to, to be respectable and to show off um, your wealth, really. So we, I, I want to make sure that we leave enough time for questions. Um, so I want to ask you one more thing. Um, and I, I see that you have uh, on the screen um, a woman playing with her racket. So I want to ask you exactly about that. Um, that in the show, you know, I, I think that's one of the things that are also are shown distinctly different between New York, between the city and Newport, um, is the centrality of leisure sports, sports activities. You know, in season one, we have the croquet match at the, I think it's, it's one of the first uh, episodes. Of course, you know, we talked about the tennis match in um, at the casino in season two. Um, and these, I, I think that in these scenes, we, we really see social life organized in a very different way that we would have in the city, uh, this mixed gender sports, very different from kind of like the, the home public sphere ethos of the city. So uh, how dressing for sports different and and what kind of influence did it have more generally on American fashion? Yeah, I think great question. And, you know, on the screen here, I've had these um, wonderful advertisements from a woman named Alice Maynard, who I just have been so enamored with trying. She's still a little bit of a shadowy figure. Um, but, you know, we see this wonderful knitwear. You know, this is the 1890s now. 
Um, so, you know, we're starting um, 1890 to 1900. So we're starting to see like even more casualness in the clothing. And I think like resort lifestyle also, again, you sort of mentioned like, you know, men and women having interaction in these more um, relaxed cir circumstances. And I think that plays out a lot with the younger um, generation of the cast, um, you know, Gla Gladys and Larry, you're always trying to get some time alone with your peers away from the chaperones and the um, old Older people and I think like sports provided great opportunity for that you could be over here on the croquet court having a little private conversation um, this is another fantastic ad that I found recently and I think this sort of speaks to the hilariousness of suddenly all of the things that you needed to bring on summer vacation with you um, and this is from a shop that was down on Thames Street kind of letting you know if you forgot any of this stuff and you're here in Newport don't worry we've got yeah too covered <laughs> yeah, exactly uh come on down so courting ritual and like relationships were very connected to I think a lot of what was um happening in resort you know and Charles Dana Gibson's like illustrations I think kind of like wonderfully uh capture some of that and again it's pretty funny the delineator magazine from 1895 i see over and over again like you can write away to get you know the rules of how to even play some of these games really funny um you know instances of women women saying all right well we set up the lawn tennis net but we're not really sure <laughs> what we're supposed to do now <laughs> so everybody um, and by the way just to sort of like a little uh, thingy um, we see on the screen actually I, I we talked about the resort fashion and like it's hallmark I think like we're seeing it right here right yes the red white and blue um, anything with a sailor collar things embroidered with anchors uh, you know these become really per pervasive and a the lot straw of straw hats Yep, the boaters, the parasols, um, all this is like, you know, and this was, I think, season one, episode one, and I was like, mm -hmm. so excited. <laughs> Off <laughs> nice. to a good start. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, and here's croquet on the beach, same thing, these like frothy little white dresses, um, lots of red, white, and blue um, stripes, uh, all of these things become very much part of the resort look. You can get the whole family kitted out here. Delineator Magazine is showing you how to get it done. Um, and I think we're kind of closing in on some of my last images. This is from Harper's Bazaar. Love it so much. We didn't talk about bicycling and they haven't yeah. shown series yet. I really hope we have, a, we have a couple of minutes. Let's talk, let's talk about that for a second. Yeah. So, you know, the bicycling craze really, really came to Newport and, um, you know, Bellevue Avenue wasn't paved. And I've talked a lot about this with my friends at the O'Drain Automobile Museum, because um, we do think about how dusty all of these white dresses must have gotten. Um, but there's so much advice about bicycling in Newport. And, you know, they say, like, if you haven't ridden a bike before, don't go out on Bellevue Avenue. Make sure you practice on the bike. <laughs> Uh, and this looks pretty ominous here. We have this two-way traffic and, you know, something else that was really popular in Newport was for the gentlemen to take the coaches out. So you wouldn't have your coachman driving um, the kind of sport of driving a carriage coaching for pleasure um, mm -hmm. was very pervasive and you would obviously, um, you know, need to be careful on Bellevue Avenue of this, uh, two-way traffic but so can you go back for a second so is that a divided skirt that we're seeing here yeah so that's a divided skirt you know safety skirt as they called it so that you wouldn't get caught up um in the chain um of your bike so such a great modification to women's dress and you know this was an illustration done by um max klepper who was in newport and sketching um from life um so i love that and, you know, here we see women arriving at the casino, these very famous lampposts that we have here. And, you know, this great now much shorter skirt than the things that we're seeing in the 1883, you know, version, the Gilded Age is still set in the 1880s. So this is where fashion is uh, is going. And, you know, they have a great example of one of these divided skirts Beautiful. in the Met collection, which uh, amazing. Uh, so I just really love that so so it's, it's almost like women coming from the city into Newport got to experiment wearing something a little 
less rigid, um, a little less restrictive and kind of were into it and wanted to like maintain that. Like it seems so much more athletic and so much more kind of energetic than, you know, what they might be wearing in the city. Absolutely. And, you know, I think it was this consumer demand for this type of clothing that then started pushing, um, you know, what becomes the New York fashion system, which are these sporty, separate clothing that's a little bit easier, breezier than, you know, the formalized styles coming from France. So I think it was incredibly influential what was happening uh, at these resort cities um, along the eastern seaboard uh, during the Gilded Age. Yeah. Wow, I don't know how 45 minutes just went by, but they did it. Uh, <laughs> and we're already getting some questions. Um, great, great. So the first question that we have, um, I think it's a really good question. What was the social status of dressmakers and milliners? Were these roles typically held by women? Yeah, so that's one of the things, and I mean, I don't know that I can say this completely, but, you know, as compared to what was happening in France, you know, a lot of the first generation of couturiers were men, you know, Jacques Doucet, Charles Frederick Worth, um, etc. But in New York, it seems like there were so many women. Um, and a lot of women who were, in fact, immigrants to this country, like Catherine Donovan, like Molly O'Hara. So within that, you know, one generation of getting here, they were upwardly mobile. Um, Catherine Donovan and Molly O'Hara both retired, extremely wealthy women. Uh, Molly O'Hara owned a lot of property um, and had an estate that was valued at probably close to a million dollars. Um, in Gilded Age money uh, at the time of her death. So um, they were very upwardly mobile and um, I think had really very successful careers. And as we saw, like sometimes you might even see their picture in a magazine, which is really, you know, really interesting thinking about sort of like the celebrity of designers. And I think uh, if I'm not wrong, this is the, the time period where kind of designer names are starting to become important. You know, in France, of course, we have Worth, the, the British Worth, but he's working in France and you kind of get that name recognition. Um, so it seems that these women are also, you know, we could kind of see them within this same system. Yeah, you know, and they were putting their own name in the dresses. And I think that that right. was significant, you know, even though they do Absolutely. kind of hold tight to that French legend of like, oh, well, it's my dress, but I, I know what's happening in France, you know, mm -hmm. but it, I think it meant something. So for Absolutely. sure. Because we even see like dressmakers into the 20th century who are not putting labels in. So that is telling you they are branding themselves. They do have a brand name to to maintain. Yeah. Um. So we, we have another interesting question. Um, do you have any information about the Black community in Newport and did their Gilded Age fashion also follow the same trends? Yeah, absolutely. And I can direct um, you to a really wonderful website that's set up by the 1696 Heritage Group here in New York. And a few years ago, there was a joint project between the Preservation Society, which stewards all the beautiful houses um, that are depicted in the series, and two wonderful historians here in Newport, um, Keith and Teresa Stokes. And they've done a lot of research into Newport's African American community. Um, and Newport was a place that provided a lot of opportunity. There was a wonderful dressmaker, a woman named Mary Dickardson, who had a shop on Bellevue Avenue. She was a competitor with uh, Catherine Donovan and had a really successful business. And Teresa Stokes has just done some really wonderful um, um, research on, on her life and work. And there was, again, a vibrant community here where people were thriving. They were business owners and very much part um, of the fabric of Newport's diverse community. Yeah, and I think, you know, one of the things that um, we're not used to seeing and we're, we're seeing in the in HBO Gilded Age is this middle class African Americans and, and they did at the time you did have, um, there were not substantial numbers, but they there was a big community of middle class African Americans and certainly uh, they were, um, they were dressing in a similar way, um, as we as we can see. Um, 
Um, another question um, is about the bathing costumes and the kind of fabrics uh, that were used or, you know, what, what can you tell us a little bit more about the bathing costumes of that time period? Yeah, right. I think as a young dress historian, the first time I actually was in the collection and really being in there with that material culture and seeing and feeling the fabrics of the bathing suits, that's when I was like, oh, wow, <laughs> you know, I'm not sure because, you know, they usually have these cotton overdresses that we see, but, you know, this woolen bodysuit um, underneath. So, you know, there's a lot of layers of clothing and then women wearing stockings and bathing shoes and sometimes even gloves, uh, you know, in into the water was really, um, I think, quite <laughs> daring. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's great to see the transition of bathing costumes in a relatively short period of time when you think about what happens between 1890 and maybe the end of the Gilded Age being sort of the 1920s. It's like, wow, you know, beach culture changes a lot. And um, in Newport, like, you know, like all the European resorts too, you really didn't lounge around in your bathing suit. You know, that's something that comes a lot with modernity. And as we move into the 1920s and 30s, you know, you went and that was, again, another one of these complex changes right Karen after wow. bathing if you're going to have lunch at the club you changed and I just I don't know how <laughs> yeah and I and I also think like we need to make the distinction between dressing and walking and kind of promenading by the sea and bathing and that was not necessarily I don't know that Bertha Russell would go in you know she might promenade um, in her beautiful gown but not necessarily maybe her daughter might um but i don't think for the older generation going in was not necessarily something that they would do in public right or, or just like today i think you know there's people who are a little bit more sporty spiced shall we say than others or people who would def definitely have different temperaments i think um you know, and I think it was people who really believed in that idea of the cold plunge and, you know, kind of like diving into the waves who might kind of go for it. Um, and then other people just, you know, it's a hassle. You get your hair wet. Like, how do you change back into this lingerie dress? <laughs> you know, it's like so interesting to think about. And um, someone's asking about corsets. Um, were corsets worn on vacation as well? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and by women of every sort of social and economic class as well. Uh, it was just like, how tight were you going to be able to lace it? And I think definitely um, corsets for sport were, you know, maybe, you know, not laced quite so tightly, but, um, you know, it was a foundation garment that, you know, women were just most comfortable wearing. And that actually um, is a perfect segue to the next question. Someone is asking about what clothes did the servant wear? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, that's really a great question. And Newport, as well as New York, were full of specialized shops where people would buy uniforms for their um, staff and servants. Um, yeah, you know, and most of what's depicted in the series is very practical, you know, darker dresses, aprons, um, you know, things things like that. Um, you know, when you're working down in the kitchen, you want to have a garment that's going to be durable um, and hard wearing. And it was really part of an employer's responsibility to provide clothing um, for their staff. Um, so, you know, that's definitely um, interesting to think about. And department stores had whole departments that, you know, specialized in livery. And so would um, New York's wealthy come to Newport with their own staff or would they have a separate staff working at their Newport mansion? Yeah, really a combination, you know, and we're sort of, find that um, there's certain household staff like ladies maids and valets that always traveled with the family. Um, and even a lot of the household staff would come for the summer. Um, but there were year round staffs at the houses, um, gardeners and people, superintendents that maintained the property all, all year. 
Um, so that was interesting. And, you know, one of the reasons to emigrate to Newport was sort of this entree with domestic service. But, you know, here in the United States, I'm finding from census records, someone was maybe only a coachman or a footman for like a year or two, and then they kind of move on and they have these economic opportunities to get maybe into the hotel business or the clothing business or the tailoring trade or open a restaurant. Um, so there's a lot of sort of that possibility here um, in a resort city. Did, did staff and servant have also a leisure time when they were out in, in Newport? Do you know? Um, I think so. You know, um, definitely, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, the, the image of 40 steps that I showed, um, you know, people would have days off and people talked about, um, you know, being able to enjoy the public beaches and, um, you know, there were closed areas, certainly the exclusivity of the casino or the more private beach clubs, but, um, New York, um, Newport had a, you know, a public beach with a boardwalk and a roller coaster and, um, all of these things that were open to everybody. What do you think about the way that Newport is depicted in the show? Um, yeah, you know, I, I like it. And I think, um, you know, we're so thrilled <laughs> to have our tiny little city by the sea um, depicted uh, in this way in the series. And um, yeah, just to really share some of the geographic beauty of the place with with people, um, you know, I think is great. And I know with filming, there are limitations because, you know, there are contemporary buildings and the streetscapes are not quite the same. Like the drive from Newport to Portsmouth on the north end of the island, uh, it must have been such a beautiful drive uh, in the Gilded Age. But like everywhere, there's a lot of development now and, and things don't look exactly the same. So I think it's a challenge to recreate with authenticity. Um, what New York really looked like in the 19th century. Um, kind of going back to like, you know, the um, accuracy of the show, someone is ash asking, um, saying that sometimes the, the dress looks very kind of gaudy, um, a lot of vertical stripes and patterns and appliques and multicolored. So um, was fashion really that over the top? Yeah, I mean, I have more of the stills that sort of tend to have the um, daytime resort wear, but I know what you mean. I know exactly, you know, what where the question's coming from. And I, you know, I've thought about that a lot myself because, you know, we are in the later part of the 19th century. We do have the advent of synthetic dyes. So those of us who have spent a lot of time in collections know that like the ultra sonic, you know, color mm -hmm these apple greens, these vibrant blues and purples that you could get from aniline dyes is actually quite um, realistic. And the couture right. houses and the French um, high-end textile manufacturers were definitely experimenting with these new technologies. So, um, you know, I think that the show does surf this really fun line of these like, you know, points of departure that are very authentic, but then the costumes are a part of the storytelling. Right, um, exactly. So. Yes, and I think also I've noticed a lot of these like like stripes going like this or like asym asymmetry in some of the ruffles and details that seems a little exaggerated. I don't remember ever, ever seeing something like that in collections. Um, but as you say, it's the starting point is is pretty accurate, but then it could they kind of take it to to the next level. Um, Rebecca, thank you so much. This is I, I could go on for another full hour. Um, I really, really appreciate that you know you shared all this wealth of information with us. It's it's been it's been an amazing uh, ride. Yeah, well, thanks a million. I just uh, love an opportunity to get to share um, some of this very specific Newport um, research with a wider audience. So thanks so much for having me. Thank you both so much. Um, I, that is unfortunately all the time that you have, although we we really could go on all night or even all week and, you know, <laughs> dissect every single episode live. Uh, that would be fantastic. Um, for more of the Center for Women's Center for Women His, Women's Histories take on the Gilded Age, I can't speak tonight, uh, please be sure to visit our blog, Women at the Center. You can also sign up for the museum's mailing list and follow us at nyhistory.org to get the latest on upcoming salon programs like this one. 
The New York Historical Society is currently open Tuesday through Sunday. You can reserve your timed entry museum tickets on our website, and we hope to see you on Central Park West soon to see our current exhibition, Women's Work, on view in our Joyce B. Cowan Women's History Gallery through August 2024. Thank you all and have such a wonderful evening.